Hey, this is Jody with WeldingTipsAndTricks.com and Welding-TV.com. This week we're talking about doing some repairs on some stainless steel shafts. We're going to do some simple repairs and then one more complicated repair uh, on shaft straightening. So this is a little trick for getting a ground on a round shaft. I don't really need to use it here, but a lot of times you might be doing this in, in some pipe vise stands or something like that. It's where it's hard to get a ground clamp on the part. So just wrapping some bare wire out of some uh, some old scrap leads or whatever, just whip, wrapping it around there and then grab, uh, clamping the ground clamp to that provides a really good ground that will let it spin and everything. So my first repair is just putting back a radius that should have been there but got machined down to a sharp corner. So for doing that, I'm just going to run just a little weave pass right in that corner, just enough to put about a 1 8 radius in there where the machinist can come back and, and mach machine a nice radius in that corner. Very simple repair, nothing to that, one pass, and uh, a nice little weave bead in there will, will work out nice for putting that radius in there. And the second repair is just filling in this little step that accidentally got machined on the journal here. And I didn't capture an arc shot of that, but it's pretty simple. Just a, a pass around there and actually took two or three more passes to get it out to where it would clean up uh, once it's machined back. This is a little bit more complicated because it requires a lot of passes and there's also a piece of carbide tool broken off in there and so the first thing I'm going to do is get that out of there with a little grinder tool. I'm going to grind that piece of uh, carbide insert out of there because if I weld over that when, it, when it's put back in the machine the tool is going to catch on that and it's going to cause a big problem and also just might be a a hard spot that might crack or something so it's a good idea to get that out of there first before I start. So you ever do this? Do you ever you ever have a grinding shield on and then it feels like a welding helmet and you're getting ready to light up and then you think it's a welding helmet but you find out it's not a welding helmet when you flip it down. And so you find out pretty quick like oh fail so now I know you've done it don't say you haven't. <laughs> so I'll just put on a welding helmet now and we'll get started on that. What I'm going to do here on this is I am going to walk the cup a little bit and then I'm also going to do a little freehanding. But the first pass I'm just going to walk the cup just because it's going to, it's, it works out nice and I've got to weld all the way around it and then go around it several more times. And walking the cup just lets it lay in that corner really nicely. And I'm just walking the puddle right up to where it just nips that, that ledge. And then coming out the same the same distance the other way. So walking the cup is a really good technique. I got nothing against it. It's just that only pretty much only pipe welders ever learn it. And if you're just uh, working in a machine shop, job shop, fab shop, or whatever, and you're not welding pipe, you may not ever get a chance to learn the walking the cup technique. So so don't worry. I'll show you both methods here. Uh, if you don't know walking the cup, don't have a chance to learn, we'll do a little freehand in here. Now I'm using uh, my product called the Tig Finger here because I'm going to put about probably about six or eight passes around this thing by the time I get that little step filled in enough to where it'll machine off cleanly. But I'm doing essentially the same thing as I would walk in the cup except I'm just doing a straight zigzag and I'm um, not really, you know, the, the term freehanding kind of makes you think you're just kind of out in the wind like you would be with an oxyacetylene torch. I'm propping with my finger that's got the TIG finger on it just to steady up. And I'm zigzagging the torch with a weave much like I would walk in the cup and it's going to wind up looking nearly the same. See that looks almost the same, slightly different. Walking the cup is, is great uh, sometimes. Sometimes you can't walk the cup through stuff in the way and if you don't know how there's another alternative for you. A little bit more versatile in fact sometimes. I'm putting another pass right dead on top of that pass and I've got to carry it on out to the very edge and, and add enough metal to where it'll all machine off and make a nice uh, step just like it was never accidentally machined the wrong way. So, so there is a there is a almost finished product out to the corner and then one more bead fill it in. Now now it'll machine off. It's it's got another twenty or thirty thousandths to go before final machining dimension. Now this repair is a little bit more difficult because it's near the middle of the shaft and it's stainless steel and stainless steel warps like a mug when you put heat on it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you some tips and tricks here on how to straighten it up. You can see it's not completely square or straight to begin with. It's out about five to ten thousandths before I ever light up on it. So I've got to at least get it back in that range. And again, it's got a good, this one's probably got a good twenty or thirty thousandths more that's going to be machined off of it before it's at final dimension. It starts out as just pipe, which is a nominal uh, outside diameter. 
and then it gets chucked up in a lathe and, and uh, machined down to a final dimension and trued up to be a shaft on some kind of conveyor line or something like that. I'm not really sure what it's going to do. But this is the first pass. I'm putting it in there just, uh, just like I did a minute ago on that other repair. It's almost like welding a lap joint. I'm just using a lay wire technique, leaving the wire in there, weaving back and forth. And honestly, it may, you know, there could be some cold lap at the very bottom in the very corner, but for this particular application, it just really doesn't matter. I want to get, I want to get it straight, where it'll machine off clean, and it's not wobbling in the way in the lathe. And I want to get finished with the job, and I, I don't want to shrink it too much because actually, on a, on a job like this, there's also because this is hollow, there's also the potential for this thing to hoop shrink. And that's going to make it make the machinist have to machine it down further if I uh, shrink it too much. So that's that won't be good. So I want to I want to kind of limit the heat input. Every time I go around it one time, I'm going to let it cool off completely. And, and then when I get it finished, I'm going to have to just do a little a little finessing to straighten it out to where it'll it'll, it'll uh, run true in the lathe or true enough anyway to to not have to cut too much off of it. So I'm, what I'm doing here is I'm just going in the same direction. Full, a full uh, 360 degrees, taking it about a, a fourth at a time, and you can kind of, if you keep an eye on that little dial indicator there, you can kind of see it moving all over the place. And when I get uh, finished with one revolution here, we'll spin it around and see how much we're out. You see, it's moving. That needle's moving all over the place right now compared to where it was a minute ago. But you can drive yourself crazy trying to keep it straight the whole time because every time I weld a quarter it moves in a different direction. The thing to do is let it cool off and then check it. We'll check it because it's going to be off a little bit while it's still hot. And what happens is that while it's still hot it's actually expanding in one area but then when it cools it shrinks further than it was to begin with. So you can see it's off a good uh, 20 or 30 thousandths right now at least. But then when it cools off completely back down to probably less than five thousandths out. So you don't try to don't try to straighten it out or a shaft or a, or a tube or anything like this before it cools off so you let so you'll know where you're, what you're working with you just do extra work all right I'm putting a second pass on this thing now again just using a lay wire weaving it it's going to take quite a bit of metal to fill that gash out and I don't know what exactly happened but the CNC lathe went nuts and it dug in the tool crashed it broke the broke the carbide insert and and then just ate into this thing like crazy so that's that's not my concern. Okay, now I've got enough metal on it now, enough reinforcement that it should machine off. But look, it's off a good fifty thousandths, off quite a bit. I, I decided mid midstream on this thing not to worry about how much it got off. I'm just going to go round and round it, get enough metal to put it to put on it, and now I'm going to look at the, at the place where it's out the most. That means it's the highest point where it's uh, kind of dog legged up. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to dry wash a little small area right here. Keep an eye on the on the dial indicator. I'm going to I'm going to put it on zero here. This is a really cheap dial indicator, but for 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 what I'm doing here, it, it serves its purpose. I'm going to put it on zero, and then I'm going to dry wash on that area where the on the top where the dial indicator is, and you can watch that that indicator move. Almost immediately when I light up on here what's going to happen is the temperature is going to start increasing in that area and the metal is going to expand and so it's going to expand and push and it's going to dog leg up even more see the dial indicator needle moving so I'm just doing a little weave dry wash here I sped it up a little bit so you wouldn't have to endure it watch too long but it moved it about between 15 and 20 thousandths and when I when I blow on air on it and cool it off, you can see immediately it starts to go back and shrink, and now it's all past it's past the zero point. So now I'm actually gaining ground. Now it's actually going back toward where it needs to be. So I've gained I've gained ten thousand in the right direction there by cooling by cooling it off. And I'm going to keep blowing on this thing until basically I can put my hand on it all the way around. Now I'm recheck. Now I'm out maybe twenty thousandths instead of fifty thousandths or 22 thousandths instead of 50 thousandths. So I'm going to do the same thing again. I'm going to locate the high point, which is right about there. And then I'm going to do a little more dry washing. And I'm going to, I'm going to dry wash to a point to where when I stop is just a little bit past 
that high point. That seemed to work out about right. So you can see again the needle moving, but it's moving in the wrong direction. It's, it seems to be making it worse, but that's a temporary effect. The metal's expanding, and then when the metal, when the molten metal solidifies and then cools on further than that, it will actually shrink to a point that was, you know, more shrunk than its original state before I before I dry washed. So again, I'll blow blow a little force cooling here on it. Now stainless steel will not harden. So force cooling it will not have a detrimental effect, metallurgically speaking. What the, the worst thing is to keep it in a hot state for a long period of time on stainless steel. And then you start to lose corrosion resistance and you get a phenomenon called uh, carbide precipitation where the uh, carbon migrates and, and you lose, con it's a whole other issue. But anyway, you can see now I'm really, really close. I'm, I'm within five thousandths like I was before I ever started welding on it and I could get it probably almost perfect but that would be that'd be overkill because again I've got another twenty or thirty thousand so it have to be machined off the diameter of this thing so really quickly here we're gonna take a little cut on the weld just to make sure there are no defects and no you know problems there and that things are seem like they're gonna clean up and there's the finished product and the weld is right there alright just a reminder for anybody that's missed the past few videos the 2012 compilation of all the videos I did on YouTube uh, in 2012 is available now on a four disc set along with a fifth bonus video as it's like a TIG, TIG welding jump start you know gets you started right on the, on the right foot uh, for TIG welding. Now that's available now it's over seven hours worth of content it's a whole year's worth of work and this is kinda how it looks there's all kinda stuff all kinds of TIG welding shots like this shot on TIG welding aluminum using this little technique of using a tight arc to penetrate and then backing off while you add the rod. Uh, all kinds of stuff like this, open V groove joint, walk in the cup, lay wire. I did a three-part series trying to help welding students out pass a 6G test. This is a 6G 2-inch Schedule 80 TIG root, TIG hot pass with a stick cap. That's on there in three parts. Lots of shots like this, TIG welding some 4140 using several different welding machines from simple scratch start machines to ACDC full-blown full feature machines there's some plasma cutting like that thin sheet metal and also uh, thicker plasma cutting like that bevel a little troubleshooting on setting wire feed speed on on what's too little what's too much on on MIG welding as well as even some MIG welding uh, aluminum with a spool gun like you see right here some techniques on that what works and what doesn't. This is the stick cover pass on that 6G joint using a 332nd 7018 putting a cover pass on that and there's also some simple stick welding using an AC buzz box and 6013 rods and even some stuff like this joint right here which was like for the Boy Scout merit badge type welds. Just a lot of different stuff like I said a whole year's worth of work. If you're interested you can learn more about it by going to welding-tv.com and click on the buy stuff button or weldingtipsandtricks.com and click on the store button. Anyway, thanks for watching and we'll see you next week on Welding Tips and Tricks.